Well, if it isn't economic crisis, it's a fuel crisis. And in this case, energy crisis in South Africa. You're still watching Report Desk Africa. And we're going to South Africa now where thousands, including members of the opposition Democratic Alliance, the DA party, have taken to the streets in Cape Town and across South Africa to protest a prolonged energy crisis that has resulted in crippling power court. Now, there's this thing they call load shedding, where they basically try to reduce the strain on the power unit. But it's, it's taking too long and it's beginning to become, you know, excessive. Demonstrators in Cape Town marched towards the ANC offices to demand realistic actions. Now, New Central's Omolola Oladi captured their views in this report. Do take a look. Gathered in the center of the financial capital of Africa's most industrialized nation, hundreds of members of the opposition party, Democratic Alliance, took to the streets of Johannesburg to protest a prolonged energy crisis causing record power cuts in South Africa. South Africans have endured power cuts for years, but 2022 was the worst on record with 205 days of rolling blackout as agent coal-fired power plant broke down. So far this year, there have been outages every day, with people complaining bitterly about how the deepening energy crisis has affected their day-to-day -day activities. Yes, I'm very angry. I'm very angry times hundreds. I'm very angry. Because when I, when I knock out to work, we're supposed to cook, I have to eat bread. It is, it is time that we took a stand as a people of this country against this corrupt government that we have and fight for what we have as rights in this country. It's time for us to stand together. Enough is enough. We want our power back. Load shedding, as it is known locally, was escalated to level six, which entails removing 6,000 megawatts worth of power from the grid in order to rebalance demand and supply. This can result in outages lasting four to five hours at a time and totaling 12 hours a day for households and businesses. Citizens, however, use this protest to call on the government to put all hands on deck to provide a lasting solution to the crisis as it is beginning to affect the country's economy. Let's, let's come back to reality. Let's face reality. The country is now gone down. So, this is a banana republic and we are the monkeys. So we must eat the bananas. It wasn't like that. But because they don't want to face reality, they're just messing everything up. I hope that everything, that, that, they, will, that, that they will look into this matter. That they will really look into this matter so that they can fix this nonsense. Despite an abundance of sunshine and wind, South Africa still derives about 80% of its electricity from coal with one nuclear power station. It is hoped that the share of renewable energy in the country will increase tremendously in order to bring a permanent solution. Omolola Ololade reporting for News Central. Well, our South African correspondent, Bongani Siziba, has been monitoring the situation and she will join us now to discuss it. Thank you so much, Bongani, for joining us. Uh, thank you, Blessing. Compliments of the season. Compliments, Compliments to you, too. You. <laughs> All right. And we also have Democratic Alliance Shadow Minister of Energy, Kevin Milham, the Parliament of South Africa. Thank you so much, Kevin, for joining us. Absolute pleasure. All right. Let's have this conversation, Bungani and Kevin. We are hearing that South African power courts have worsened as ESCOM extends worst ever outages, leaving more South Africans without power for longer hours. And we're talking up to six hours a day, seven hours a day, really outrageous. What exactly is the latest on this issue, Bongani? Yeah, the, the situation here in South Africa on uh, electricity crisis is quite dire. Uh, like can allude to uh, the package that was just playing now because uh, it I'm also affected because you find out that uh, sometimes we are told that the electricity will go for three, four, five, six hours, but it exceeds to that. And now we can't even uh, buy perishable goods because uh, you don't know when you will have the electricity back. So it's not only affecting us as individuals, but it's also affecting our businesses, small businesses, 
uh, big businesses. I was in one factory and uh, machines were just stuck there. They, they have not uh, used their machines for, for at least a month because uh, the generators that they have are smaller. Uh, they can't use them for, for, for manufacturing. You go into supermarkets, one minute there's electricity, the other there's no electricity. Business have gone down. And um, sometimes you look at it at how um, also uh, citizens are protesting about it and it's justified. And uh, the electricity crisis in South Africa has gone beyond and um, we don't know if it's something that will be fixed soon. Mm. That's quite, uh, quite, quite sad. We do hear, you know, lots of these stories coming out from South Africa, and South Africans really bitterly complaining, like we saw in, saw in that report. But Kevin, I would like to ask you, you know, in your opinion, how, how do you, how, how did South Africa get here, and um, could there have been anything possible that that could have been done to avert and to avoid the situation getting as bad as it is right now that wasn't done in the past? Absolutely. So this power crisis, this electricity crisis, has been something that has been coming for many, many years. Mm. In fact, the ANC were warned about it in 1998. The White Paper on Energy in 1998 said that if we didn't build new power stations before 2007, South Africa would run out of electricity, and that's exactly what happened. So in 2008, the ANC government rushed out and issued a tender for the two biggest coal-fired power plants in the world, Madupi and Kusile. And because of ANC corruption and mismanagement, uh, it's taken them more than 15 years to get to where we are now. Those power plants are still not complete. They're still not fully operational. In fact, they're breaking down and falling apart. And there are hundreds of billions of rand over budget. They could have built an additional two or three Madupi and Kusiles for the price that they've paid for the two that they have built and, and that aren't operating perfectly. Now, the other part of it was that uh, our existing fleet of power plants has been run so hard that they are falling apart. They're basically held together with chewing gum and spit, um, and, and we, are, we are running them into the ground to try and keep the lights on. ESCOM has gone massively into debt and is unable to purchase any more diesel for its peaking plants, which means that they are unable to reduce uh, the stage of load shedding which means that most people are now on stage five load shedding, um, which is about six to eight hours of load shedding per day where there is no electricity. And that has an enormous impact, not just on ordinary people's lives who, who can't cook, uh, students can't study, people can't get hot water to wash, there's no light, they sit in darkness, but it's also caused businesses to fail it's caused our economy to stagnate. Over the last 15 years, the ongoing effects of load shedding has caused our economy to basically not grow at all. And as a result, we have the highest unemployment in the world in South Africa right now. I mean, uh, Kevin, it's quite ironic how this issue has caused a lot of unbalance in, in the system. And looking at how there are two massive power plants, but like you said, due to mismanagement, uh, you, you know, South Africa still suffers load shedding uh, in stage five now. And they're talking about stage six. Imagine what that will be. Now, there are some other African countries that have over the years suffered irregular power and have been able to find ways around it. Don't you think it's high time South Africans invested in alternative sources of power supply like solar and, I mean, maybe petrol power generators? Absolutely. So the, the first thing is that there is ample coal in South Africa to meet our needs. We're not, we don't have a shortage of coal supply, but we don't have power plants that are operational that, are, that have been well maintained to utilize that, that, uh, that coal. That's the first thing. The second thing is we've run out of money to, to, to uh, pay for the diesel plants. ESCOM doesn't have enough money. They need a bailout, and they need that quickly to keep the diesel-fired plants operational. But we should have, um, we, we did have, the best renewable energy program in the world for many, many years. And that was running well up until about 2015 when the ANC government and some of the corrupt officials, uh, I'm sure you've heard about state capture, uh, they captured ESCOM and uh, they, they shut down the power purchase agreements with renewable energy power producers. So for the last seven or eight years, those renewable energy power producers were not able to, to provide any, any additional electricity to the grid. We're not going to be able to fix ESCOM until we build new generation capacity. We've got the best wind and solar resources on the continent and we should be using them every single day. Mm. Bongani, do you, do you agree with this? 
you know, um, having alternative uh, alternative sources of energy, uh, South Africa having some of the best wind and solar um, sources of energy, and should be put into into you know uh, ad adequate use. Yes, Bernard, I, I definitely agree with uh, Kevin. Uh, it, that reminds me of the article that I wrote recently on why South Africa is not moving to renewable energy when uh, South Africa is one of the African countries that has best resources. We're talking of, of, of the sunshine, we're talking of wind, to move to renewable energy. And also that South Africa got funding that they should start moving to renewable energy, but there is hesitance. So it's one of the things that are, are here in South Africa, we are saying, why is the government so hesitant to start moving to renewable energy so that they can uh, also um, uh, alleviate this pain that uh, the citizens are going through of uh, electricity uh, crisis. Uh, and we talk about uh, how uh, some of the power stations every now and then we hear that uh, they've been breakdowns. And those breakdowns, what, what has been done, because like what Kevin has just said, that uh, this problem didn't start today. It's a problem that uh, started years ago, and the government had time to fix this problem, but uh, they didn't. Now uh, it seems like it's an emergency crisis, of which it's something that they knew for years. All right. Um, uh, just before we go to, before blessings goes to Kevin, I, I would like to ask you, Bongani, you know, again, um, you know, the rest of the world reads this in the papers, reads it on the internet and sees this in the news, but it, 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 when, when it's close to home, it hits differently. So I want to ask you, Bongani, first, um, I know when we reached out to you earlier today, you did say that during the course of this program, your own region where you stay might be in uh, load shedding, uh, would I say load shedding time frame. How has this affected you personally? It has affected me so badly. Uh, I had to drive out of my zone because uh, the electricity here goes uh, with zones. And you find out that uh, in your zones, there are three, four areas that are around you. So for you to have electricity when you don't have electricity in your zone, you have to drive up to 20, 30 minutes to find a place where there is electricity. And now, let's say I'm coming out coming from the field and I need to file a story. And in my place, there's no electricity or at the office. What do I have to do? I have to drive for 30 minutes so that I'll be able to file. This is not, not talking about uh, filing only. You get home, you are hungry. There's no electricity for more than six hours. And when you expect it to come back, it comes back. Before you even uh, finish cooking your, your meal, the electricity is gone. And uh, this is not only uh, about me as an individual. Also, other people are experiencing the same thing. You find out that our students are now studying in restaurants. Uh, people, some of the people are now no longer employed because companies can't pick, keep people when there is no work that they can do. So some of the people have been uh, uh, chased out, out, out of work. They are no longer having employment because of uh, the same problem of uh, electricity crisis. So this crisis, it's really a, a big crisis if you are here, here in South Africa, more than what uh, you people are hearing from outside. All right, thank you so much, Bongani. Um, Kevin, I'd also like to ask you, now we hear that there are protests in South Africa about the load shedding, and even the opposition party, Democratic Alliance, are also protesting the load shedding. So first of all, do you think that this protest is going to have any impact? And we're seeing the DA protesting. Is there something different they would have done if they were in power? So for starters, let me say that, that the protests are merely an expression of the outrage and the anger that is felt by every single South African about load shedding. And part of that anger is about the fact that the ministers and the presidents don't feel the pain because they have taxpayer funded generators at their homes that they don't pay a cent for. They don't pay for the fuel. They don't pay for the electricity. They, they are kept with lights on day in and day out. So they don't feel the pain that every other South African goes through. So that's part of why we are protesting. The second is that it's the start of a much longer mass action campaign where we are going to be pushing government on every single aspect of their energy policy. And the biggest problem that we have is that there is no sense of political urgency or political will in the African National Congress to admit that, that there is a crisis and that they have been the cause of the crisis, that it has been their corruption, their mismanagement, their state capture, their, their incompetence that has caused the problem that we face ourselves in. The Minister of Energy, Gwede Mantashe, is a coal fundamentalist. 
He is unwilling to speed up the rollout of renewable energy. He is unwilling to open the grid to allow businesses and domestic users to put solar panels on their roofs and to, to make it easier and cheaper for them to do so, despite the fact that that would make an enormous impact on reducing demand on ESCOM and allow them to, to do the maintenance they need to repair their power plants. So we've got incompetence and political uh, a lack of political will at every level. In fact, if you go back to 2015, then Deputy President Cyril Ramaphosa said, in two years, you'll forget that load shedding ever happened. Well, that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Last week, uh, uh, Gwede Mantashe, the Minister of Energy, said in six months to, to, to six to 12 months, load shedding will be a thing of the past. That's not going to happen. Uh, Enoch Gorongwana, the Minister of Finance, he said, no, 12 to 18 months, load shedding will be a thing of the past. But ESCOM have admitted that it's going to be at least two to three years before they are anywhere close to reducing the load shedding that we are we are experiencing. And what's really, really sad is that this year, every single day we've had load shedding. It's the first time in history that we've had load shedding every single day, and it's affecting everyone. It's affecting businesses. It's affecting ordinary South Africans, and, and we just cannot continue like this. That's quite, quite, quite sad. And we do hope uh, definitely that uh, uh, the power supply and energy uh, crisis in South Africa will improve. But like you said, two to three years, as ESCOM predicted, that is quite a scary and long period. We certainly hope that things get better down in the south. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us. Bongani, it's always a pleasure having you with us. And uh, compliments of the season to you, Bongani. You didn't say that to me anyway. Compliments <laughs> of the season to you. All right, then. Thank you so much for thank joining you, us. Thank you, Bongani and Kevin. Thank you.